don't need water, do you? Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I am your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. The crimes of which Donald Trump and his uh, cohorts have been accused of are confusing. Uh, is collusion a crime? Uh, what about conspiracy? And how does uh, the fact that Manafort was guilty of tax evasion and Cohen says that he is uh, uh, he has named Donald Trump as the unindicted co-conspirator in his payoffs. How does it all relate? How do we actually prosecute this guy? What is Mueller doing? We got a, a trial coming up uh, soon about Manafort in Ukraine. What is the legal basis for all of this? To answer that question, I've invited a longtime white collar prosecutor, former white collar prosecutor, assistant U.S. attorney with the District of Columbia named Randall Eliason, and I will get to him and your questions in just a few moments. First, though, I got to say something about John McCain, who, of course, died last Saturday. Um, I, like many liberals, obviously had reason to disagree with John McCain. Um, he uh, certainly supported President Obama. I did many shows about why I thought that Obama would be a better president than John McCain based on their policies. And I think John McCain has made mistakes over the years, but I have never doubted for an instant the man's integrity, his honesty, his decency. When he made mistakes, he said the mistakes he made. And when I look at the people who brought up conspiracy theories against Barack Obama that were shot down by John McCain. I'm reminded of the night and day difference between John McCain and the current president of the United States. Fascinating poll I saw just yesterday. Some 60% of Democrats have positive feelings about John McCain. That includes me. And after all, we disagree with him on much of his policies. Some 40% of Republicans only 40% of Republicans have positive views on, of John McCain today. My guess is two years ago, that was 80 or 90%. It tells you something about where the current Republican Party is, where current Republicans are, that this war hero, this patriotic American, that so many Republicans don't have positive views of the man. And it's not for his policy views, dare I say, because I think they've drunk the poison, the Kool-Aid, of that cult leader, Donald Trump. All right, let me get to my main topic today. First, I want to do is introduce uh, Randall Eliason. Uh, uh, Randall, you were a prosecutor for, uh, for white collar crimes for how many years? Um, about eight years doing white collar, 12 years as a prosecutor. 12 years as a prosecutor in total in the District of Columbia, right. where you would deal with the most political crimes. I mean, that's where the most if you if you've done a, a campaign finance violation or a bribe or some kind of political crime, I assume that the DC office would prosecute more often than, than the other offices. Yeah, you well, know, it can happen anywhere. You know, right. Is widespread across the country, but a lot of it is in Washington, both with the uh, the DC U.S. Attorney's Office and, of course, Maine Justice being here as well. So, how did you end up going after white collar criminals? Is that your mm -hmm. choice, or were you assigned to that? Uh, no, it was my choice. I mean, when you go into the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C., you start off usually doing violent crime, street crime, drugs, things like that. Um, but uh, I, I applied to go to the white collar section. I think the cases are really interesting, very challenging. Uh, the investigations are, are, you know, a lot more in depth, and they they present some real challenges because they focus on primarily proof of intent. You know, I mean, the biggest issue. You know, if I got a shooting case, I got a dead body on the street. I know somebody's committed a crime. And the biggest issue is usually finding out who did it and can we prove who did it. In white collar, you're often trying to prove what's going on in someone's head. And those are very interesting, challenging cases, you know, because you can prove, uh, you know, I gave the congressman, I gave the senator a bunch of free trips on my private jet, you know, but proving that that was done with a corrupt intent does a bribe as opposed to because we've been friends for 20 years, you know, which was the sort of Bob Menendez issue in, the, in his recent trial. Uh, th those are are really challenging issues and fun cases to work on. It's even more challenging recently because of a, a United States Supreme Court decision on uh, our ex-Virginia governor, Bob McDonald, right, right. who was convicted in the lower court 
Uh, the jury found he was guilty, found he had corrupt intent when he took $177,000 or so, including payments for his daughter's wedding and a Rolodex watch for this lobbyist. Uh, but the court found, well, yeah, he took all that money, but he didn't give that much for it. He just gave constituent service. Uh, he made a few phone calls uh, and on his, his client's behalf, his, his constituent's behalf. I mean, I, I'm a Virginia State delegate. I make calls on my, on my constituent's mm -hmm. behalf. Um, do you agree with that Supreme Court decision? Do you think they had too narrow a reading of the law? And how do you determine, does it have to be a quid pro quo? Yes, I mean, I, I don't agree with it at all. I think it was a real unfortunate decision. The kind of startling thing about it was, as you said, you know, the, the trial jury had no problem finding him guilty. No. The Fourth Circuit unanimously affirmed. Right. And then they unanimously refused to hear it, you know, get with the full court. And then the Supreme Court unanimously reverses. So it was kind of a, a th you know, the fact that it was unanimous, I find really surprising. Um, but clearly what the court was worried about was prosecutors going after politicians for what they called sort of routine political courtesies, you know, and they, they felt that whatever McDonald did in exchange wasn't substantial enough. Um, so the guy I, that gave him the money had the corrupt intent, but they couldn't prove McDonald. Had the right, intent. and they gave immunity to the guy that gave him the money. So right. He testified. So he couldn't go after him. He was the star witness. Um, so, you know, the, the uh, I think that was... A, it's an extremely narrow view of corruption because what McDonald was doing was selling access to the power of his office, right? He had no other prior relationship with this guy who was paying him. It's not like they were friends for a long time or anything. The only reason this guy was giving him all these gifts was to get something from McDonald. And McDonald at least And he tried. basically testified to that. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and McDonald tried to comply. He just didn't have much luck. He was actually probably saved by his staff. You know, he'd refer Williams to his staff and say, hey, meet with this guy and maybe we can you know, do research studies on his product, and the staff just kind of blew the guy off because they thought he wasn't very serious. You know, As I recall, he was, he was looking yeah. for the health benefits of tobacco. Yeah, he had this what? product, uh, <laughs> an Atablock, that yeah. was made from tobacco extracts. Right, yeah. right. Uh, yeah. You know, um, one of the, sort of the most, more notorious unhealthy products. Um, yeah. But but let me get to, again, and we're going to get to the specifics on Donald Trump, I promise, in this hour. But in general, I read an article recently, um, I don't remember where it was, but suggested that Paul Manafort would have gotten away with it, with stealing, you know, billions of dollars. I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars off, you know, whole chunk of change. I don't remember the exact number. Mm -hmm. Not paying taxes on it. That this is regularly done. That this is done all the time by influence peddling in Washington. And only because he made the mistake of, of, of working for Donald Trump and having someone like Robert Mueller look at his, his stuff to see that he's, there's overwhelming evidence of a crime. Is it true, in your view, that white collar crimes are rarely prosecuted, maybe because they're so difficult, maybe because they're not for resources for it, and that for every Paul Manafort that's prosecuted, there's 10 or, or more that are getting away with it? Yeah, I think it's over, an overstatement to say the only reason Manafort got in trouble was because of the Mueller investigation. I mean, there are reports that prosecutors were looking at him for a long time uh, based on apparent shady financial dealings. So I think that's an overstatement. On the other hand, it is true that white collar cases are hard to detect. They're difficult to prosecute. They're uh, time consuming and resource intensive. You know, so they're hard cases to bring. And there's a lot of it, uh, I think, undoubtedly going on that has not come to light. So to that extent, the point is fair. I mean, the, and especially after 9-11, a lot of federal law enforcement resources were directed away from things like white collar crime into things like terrorism and, and violent crime. And there, there's been a real drop off in, uh, in the cases that are brought. Now, you, you did white collar crime for eight years. You actually led the unit in DC for yes. two years. Yes. Um, were, uh, obviously you can't, if something's confidential, I know you won't tell me, but were you begging for resources? Is this something where you feel like if, if white collar crime had more resources, we could punish more of these criminals? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, and that's always the case, right? Every administration, every Department of Justice has to balance its sort of law enforcement priorities. And, and uh, you know, I, I would say we were begging for resources, but I think it's always, the, always true that law enforcement resources are finite. There's probably a natural tendency to, to worry more about things like violent crime, terrorism, you know, people where people's lives are actually at risk versus a lot of white collar crimes, which you can characterize but, as more but regulatory violent crime money. It's you know, distinct you know, from terrorism. Yeah, I mean, yeah. most violent crime is prosecuted under state law. Yep, that's true. Uh, uh, murder, 
people are always surprised to learn this, is not a federal crime. Yeah. It is if maybe if you murder a, you know, a, a congressman or, 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 or you do it on national park property or something. But in general, murder is not a federal crime. That's what we have states for. Yep. Uh, so it seems to me that you know, white collar crimes, whether it's campaign violations or SEC violations, they're often violations of federal law. And they're often you know, these really complex, big, big dollar ki kind of deals here. Um, one of the complaints about not just this case, it's true with all of them. You can, Ma Benendez, there was um, uh, the senator from Alaska. Um, oh, uh, Ted, uh, Ted Stevens. Ted Stevens. Right. Mm -hmm. There was, um, or Bill Clinton, any of them, the complaints are, well, you know what? This is politically motivated. I mean, there's, right. re there's, there's, the it just happens, just so happens that the two congressmen that first endorsed Donald Trump, number one and number two, uh, Duncan Hunter and, and Charlie, um, the guy in New York, whose name, uh, Collins, Chris Collins, is that his name? I, I remember. Anyway, the two that first endorsed Donald Trump are now up on, one's up on SEC violations, the other one is is Duncan Hunter took hundreds of thousands of dollars out of his campaign account and spent it on, on God knows what, he's blaming his wife now. Mm -hmm. but, but there's always going to be the argument, hey, this is politically motivated. I know with Ted Stevens, like you don't want him to be their senator from Alaska. That's why you're going after him. There was some criticism of prosecutors for that. How do you in your department, which is consists of Americans and Americans are Democrats and Republicans and independents and everyone's got a view. Peter Strzok, for example, a FBI agent, right. but no indication he did anything wrong, but he had a view, he didn't like Donald Trump. I don't like Donald Trump. How do you ensure that it's done based on the law and not based on politics? I mean, I said that's the that's the textbook defense in any public corruption case is that this is politically motivated. They're out to get me. I mean, Ted Stevens was prosecuted by the Bush Justice Department. So that's true. Republican, and these two Republican Fair congressmen enough. have been prosecuted by, by the Trump's Trump. Justice Department. So, also true. You know, it's clearly not the case that it's always one party going after the other. But whenever it happens, that's the allegation. That this is just political. Um, all you can do is have try to instill a culture within your prosecutor's office and within places like the FBI where those kind of considerations are just irrelevant to the cases that you bring. And this was Strzok's defense, you bring him up. Um, you know, he said, yeah, I have my personal political views, but they did nothing to affect my work. Yeah, and, and, the, office, and the, the inspector general, in fact, found that nothing affected his work. Yep. Of course, he was still fired by, yep. by, by the Trump administration. So yeah. this is a dangerous, dangerous job uh, for right. your, for your uh, career, um, uh, you know. I mean, you, you, were, you were two years under um, Bill Clinton, right? Um, I have to think for a second now. So I was, I was 99 to I was 01. hired under, under, well, when I first hired, I was under Bush one. Bush one. Yeah. And then you served under and Clinton. I served under Clinton for the full eight years. And then and under, was uh, it political that you were gone or no, you just, you know, you, 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 yeah. you voluntarily. Yeah. Okay. All right. Got to take a break. When we come back, I want to get to the specifics about what everyone's waiting for, which is the allegations against our, uh, our, our president. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave off the edges for the moment. 888 mark if you want to call in, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs> okay. Everything coming through, Mark? Sure, I will do that. All right, how we do? All right, do you want to have it tested or? Test, test, test. <clears throat> All right, so this is about as loud as I'll be. Yes, test one, two, three, four, five. Now I'm getting some kind of reverb or something. Oh, okay. All right, All right. I'll I'll shoot up a little bit. All right. Test, test one, two, three, four, five. I also think you're not speaking now and closing the mic as you do when we're talking. No, probably. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. In these breaks, if there's anything that I've missed or I've stated wrong or I need to bring up or a side point, you know, okay. let me know and I'll bring it up during the... Uh... The other thing you should know, just just so you're aware, um, we're, we're obviously off the radio now. We are still Facebook living the whole hour through. So yeah. anything you say in these breaks can and will be used against you um, <laughs> for anyone who has Facebook Live. That is good so, to know. So right. yes, I just want to let you know that uh, we don't want an open mic situation that, that uh, That's right. I appreciate that. has bedeviled everyone from. Best for a glass of water. 
Oh, I can, that I can get you. Do you have anything? Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just vamp if it comes back before you return. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, they moved the water cooler up there. They uh -oh. apologize. Okay. There is a bathroom which you can go to in the next break. <laughs> sorry, did I tickle in your throat or something? Yeah, just I had class today, so I've been talking a lot today. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, no, there used to be a, a water cooler over there, and it's not there anymore. So it's probably it's not my office. I'm I'm here by the good graces of the Center for American Progress. And how long have you been doing this? Uh, I've been doing radio for 15 years. I've been at CAP for about hmm, maybe four years here, maybe five years. Where does the uh, program get, get carried? It's in 40 markets, coast to coast, um, and yeah. on Facebook Live, yeah. and podcast, and iTunes, and Progressive Voices app is probably how you allow listeners from Progressive Voices. It's an app on your iPhone. You can tell people to listen wherever they are, or they can watch it on uh, facebook.com slash talk if they want to see you. We have many more uh, listeners than we do watchers on Facebook, but because, uh, although I'll tell you, like live, we, we might get, I don't know, 100, but after it's done on the archive, we'll get, we'll get over 1,000. Just, just on the video alone, and that—that's not the tens of thousands on radio. That's right. just uh, right. that's why I turn it towards you when you're speaking. Okay. <clears throat> we'll be back shortly, folks. <clears throat> oh, well, you probably don't want to drink someone else's water. Yeah, I saw that, but it looks like it's been open. So yeah. In the past, so it's <laughs> probably okay. But sorry about that. I actually, I'm usually here alone. I don't usually have guests, so, you know, I mean, I, I do, but because I'm still on the phone. You're actually the first to ask for water, and I'm disappointed because there used to be a cooler over here. Oh, but it's not there. Ready. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. I, my guest today is Randall Eliason. He is a former prosecutor, federal prosecutor in the District of Columbia. In fact, he headed up the White Collar Crimes Unit. And I'm asking him about the, well, let's start with the indictment against a, uh, a lawyer by the name of Michael Cohen and an unindicted co-conspirator by the name of Donald Trump. Um, there's, first, there's a question of whether a pre sitting president can be indicted at all. Richard Nixon was famously also an unindicted co-conspirator, and um, that was enough to get articles of impeachment passed in the House Judiciary Committee and the resignation of the president. Um, and then probably he would have been prosecuted had he not been pardoned by, by Gerald Ford. Um, but the, at least the Justice Department has a memo dating back to the Watergate years that says you can't indict a sitting president, but never really been challenged in a court because it's never happened before. Right. Do you have views on that? Can you indict a sitting president? Well, I don't know that I have personal views. I mean, but it is in fact the Department of Justice policy. It's been affirmed twice. It was affirmed again in the Clinton years um, that uh, the official position is that you can't indict a sitting US president. That doesn't mean he can't be charged. It just means he's got to be removed from office first. Before, um, before you can actually yeah, convict him. Yeah. Now, um, is, I mean, Richard Nixon's Justice Department would have had an incentive to protect him. Bill Clinton's Justice Department would have had an incentive to protect him. So would Donald Trump's Justice Department. Um, part of the problem is the Justice Department is run by the Attorney General who's appointed by the President of the United States. So um, this idea that you can't appoint, you can't indict a sitting president is certainly convenient. Uh, but Donald Trump famously said that he could 
walk down the street in, in uh, Times Square and shoot someone in the face and his supporters wouldn't, wouldn't stop him. Uh, how far does this principle go? I mean, do you have to, if, if the president commits murder and has blood on his hands on national TV, uh, do you have to quickly impeach him and convict him uh, and as quickly as possible? I mean, is, is there no limit to this principle? Yeah, I think that's the idea. I mean, the, because the, the, the policy is based on the notion that the president as the head of the executive branch and the Justice Department basically can't prosecute himself. And you get into all kinds of thorny questions like if someone indicts him, can he order the indictment be dismissed? You know, or can he pardon himself? I mean, there's all kinds of just is untested, but really murky, difficult <laughs> questions that, you know, the, the Constitution, I think, puts this in the category of political remedies, not legal ones. And so if you had a president engage in that kind of misconduct, the procedure is provided by the Constitution is to have him removed or her removed by impeachment. And then, uh, and then they're free to be prosecuted. And the Constitution expressly says that. Um, but uh, you know, then the then the issue or the concern becomes, you know, if you have a, a pliant Congress who isn't interested in impeaching the president, then then what do you do? Um, well, then there's a the question in general of how you even investigate the president. And that's why we get this complex stuff about special counsels. Right. Uh, whether it was, uh, you know, Archibald Cox who went after Richard Nixon and then was fired by him famously on a Saturday night, called the Saturday Night Massacre, uh, or the special counsel law. This stuff gets really confusing, and yet there has to be a way to police the president. We'll get back to that right after the break. Folks, if you want to call in and join the conversation, please do. Otherwise, I got plenty to ask him here myself. 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. Right back right after this. So short one. <clears throat> yeah. How bad is the tickle in your throat? You sure? Yeah. yeah. Go another half hour? Yeah. 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 No it, it tends to be long, short, long, short. Okay, that's that's how it. That's just how it goes. I don't know if you want to get into it. Um, I don't want to sort of split legal hairs, but the unindicted co-conspirator is not really accurate. Um, first of all, Cohen wasn't indicted, and he wasn't charged with conspiracy, so you can't. He wasn't Cohen, indicted. Right, he pled guilty. He pled guilty. No yeah. And he pled guilty to tax evasion, bank and, fraud, and campaign, and campaign violations. Yeah. And he said in his campaign violations, he was directed to do so by Donald Trump. Right. So you could, I mean, you can say that implicates the president in some criminal conduct, but it's not really accurate to call him an unindicted. Because he's not a co, cons well, he, There's no conspiracy when, when two people yeah. commit a crime together and it's not conspiracy, what do you call it? Well, well you call it whatever the crime was. So in essence, um, uh, Donald Trump is an unindicted. Um, um, it's probably pretty far down in the weeds. No, I know. I no, mean, I'm just. I'm just I, I love to call it correctly, though. The, I'm just the, trying the to. The concept think. is is fair. It's just technically. I hear you. Well, so if 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 um if two people are guilty of um bank fraud uh, of robbing a bank together, they both go in and rob the bank, okay. and uh, A flips against B. Um, and then I, I charge B with robbing a bank, and I note that A and B did it together in the charging document. Mm -hmm. A is in that case, what? The person who's not charged, but was right. involved in the same crime. Cooperating co-defendant. Yeah. I mean, if you cooperating yeah. co-defendant. Well, he's I mean, not they cooperating. Pled, they pled guilty and they're right. cooperating. Right, right, right. 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 Um, co-defendant in a. Uh, Implicated in a felony. I'm just trying to yeah. get the right word. Yeah, implicated was, felon. I, I'll, yeah. I'll accept that. Yeah. Donald Trump is an implicated felon. Yeah, it was implicated by Cohen when he pled guilty. Right. But strictly, a strictly unindicted co-conspirator would be you had a, an a indictment conspiracy, a conspiracy count in it. Right. That says this is Michael Cohen a, and other, you know, and uh, right. you know, Donald the, J. Trump. Right. Um, right. That may still come, but they're not. He's not. Right. So he's an unindicted. Um. I mean, Cohen's unindicted too. He pled true. guilty. There was no indictment. He voluntarily he entered into a, a guilty plea agreement. The grand jury did not indict Michael. He's Cohen. a co-felon. He's a charged felon. Was he? He wasn't, he wasn't charged. I know. It's tricky. I just say you know impl implicated by Michael Cohen in in felon. criminal conduct. Yeah. Yeah. That's my kind of, yeah. But again, it's kind of splitting hairs. No, it's it's tricky to get the right phrase. Yeah. 
everybody's undyed co-conspirator comes from the rich and Nixon years, so people right. are, are using that term. Right. The thing that says the president can be prosecuted after impeachment, where is that in here? Yeah. This is the part that says he can remove. Testament. I think it's in. I think it's in Article One. I think it's in the. Um, yeah, let me look. I think yeah. it's in. Uh, I think it's in Article One, not Article Two. That's why I can't find it. Article One, probably Section Eight, or Section Nine. Impeachments. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to remove from office and disqualification, but the party conviction shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and prosecution. So it makes clear that if you're convicted of impeachment, you're liable to indictment. It doesn't actually say the negative, that if you're not impeached, you can't be indicted. No. That. So that's, that's the part that's ambiguous. It's clear you can be indicted after impeachment. Like you said, it's unsettled. Right. Yeah. Yep. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. My guest today is Randall Eliason. He's the former head of the White Collar Crimes Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. U.S. Attorney's in Office yeah. in D.C. Right. right. So you worked for the District of Columbia right. rather than the... Um, Not Main Justice. Yeah. Not main justice. Yeah. All right, fair enough. Uh, but what's a, but you're a federal prosecutor. Right. So um, let's just go through the things that, that Donald Trump's alleged to have done and talk about sort of how a prosecution would work. And let's start with the fact that Donald Trump has been implicated in a felony. We have uh, his lawyer, Michael Cohen, who's pled guilty to campaign finance violations, said he was directed to do so by Donald Trump. Now, there's no trial here. He doesn't even have to be indicted. He's pled guilty. Right. So trial done. He's done. But when you implicate someone by pleading guilty, obviously that doesn't require your co-defendant to, to, to be guilty. Um, if Donald Trump, let's just say for a moment he weren't president of the United States, okay? He's, he's a guy who orders his counsel to do campaign violations like the ones here. They, they, they pay off uh, someone um, to keep them quiet and they don't they don't report it. How would you prosecute that crime? Yeah, well, then you would think if it were someone who's not say the a congressman, say yeah, a congressman, yeah. senator, some political. Person. The typical thing in a situation like this would be you would think that then they are going to use Cohen to build the case against other people involved mm -hmm. and the people that are higher up. So you might expect that Cohen would then would be testify. called on to testify, and you'd end up charging or prosecuting the, the politician. The politician. The candidate. Right? Let me talk about the payoffs because there's been some confusion about this, and I think some of the confusion has been put forward by the president. He argues that um, even if he paid it, and at this point, it's kind of hard to deny he paid it. He's kind of admitted it. Um, anyone can loan any amount of money they want to their campaign. Uh, so even if he paid it, even if he paid it for campaign reasons, he says it's not a campaign violation. He didn't disclose it, but that's tiny stuff. Things don't get disclosed all the time. Therefore, yeah, maybe a fine, but it doesn't rise to the level of, of a felony. Yeah. How, how would you respond to that? Well, if you, did the, if you structure the transactions to disguise them the way that Cohen pled guilty to, and you do it knowing that it's a campaign violation to do that, then it's still a felony um, because you are thwarting the underlying purpose of these campaign laws, which is to disclose where the money is coming from, right? So you've got all these kind of almost money laundering aspects that are alleged where they set up the phony invoices for Michael Cohen to pay him back and things like that. That's all by way of disguising the, the true source of the money and the fact that this donation was made. So that's definitely a campaign violation. The other aspect of, at least as the, the, the one payoff is that it came from a corporation, which that, is a whole which, separate- which, is, which you can't do right. at all in federal law. Right. Can't come, it came from the Trump organization, you can't do that. Then there's the question of, well, it was personal. Yeah, I didn't want these women to talk. I was paying them off to shut them up because I didn't want my wife to find out. Um, John Edwards famously was accused, a presidential candidate, mm -hmm. uh, accused of the exact same thing, was acquitted. That no, wasn't acquitted. It was a hung jury, as I recall. It was a hung jury. And the jury, the people that, that would have acquitted him said, well, he had a child by this woman. He'd been paying child support for a number of years. It wasn't, it was a regular 
payoff, right. and therefore it wasn't a campaign payoff. Whereas with Stormy Daniels, uh, the the sexual acts occurred with him and Car her and Karen McDougal in 2006 and 2011, and they got nothing for for all these years. And then suddenly in October of the uh, 2016, they both got substantial payments right. not to tell their stories. Is that timing sufficient for yeah, a guilty I mean, plea? That's very important. I mean, guilty all finding. of these things are really fact specific, right? So, but that's a really critical factual distinction that you have identified between the Edwards case and this case. The the, the suspicious timing that the payoffs were made right before the election um, certainly makes it look much more like they were designed to influence the campaign, as opposed to, as you said, with the Edwards situation, there was more of a pattern of support over time, and, and that link was was quite a bit weaker. And any payment designed to help the campaign is a campaign expenditure. Yeah, think of value given to the campaign, right? So I, I, it's not just I have to buy uh, uh, TV ads or it's sort of the traditional campaign expense. Paying hush money to a prostitute, yeah, that, that, that counts. Or providing stolen emails from your candidate's email account, for example, to be considered a thing of value donated to the campaign. Well, that's a nice segue to the next question, <laughs> which is collusion. Uh, Donald Trump famously said publicly, not privately, uh, hey, Russia, if you're listening, uh, I want you to um, hack into Hillary Clinton's email. He didn't quite put it this way, but he said, if you're listening, give me Clinton's email. So what he's really saying implicitly is if you're listening, I want you to commit espionage. I want you to hack into Hillary Clinton's email account. I want you to break any number of U.S. laws and um, get me that material to help me in my campaign. Okay, Russia? Mm -hmm. um, I think he later said it was a joke. Oh, it was a very specific joke. Uh, hey, that's so funny. Hey, will you please kill my wife? That's just a very, you know, not, not that funny. But um, uh, he says it publicly. Some have said, well, he didn't say it privately. You know, we can't prove that yet. Would that alone, I remember when he said it, thinking, wow, that, that sounds, um, if not treason, at least awfully problematic. When he said it yeah. two years ago, um, but I don't remember people jumping at that time to run and accuse him of a crime. I think that particular incident has never really bowled me over as much. That seemed like Trump just being Trump and kind of, you know, shooting off his mouth. I mean, I think if you were really going to be conspiring with the Russians, you wouldn't do it during a campaign rally speech and, and invite them uh, to, to do the work for you. You'd have some kind of back channel communications, right? So I'm much more interested in things like the Trump Tower meeting and the other contacts that took place that that were not public. Or his son-in-law trying to set up a private channel with Putin. Yeah, things like that. The stuff that takes place in secret is more likely to be, you know, indicative of some kind of conspiracy, I think, than that kind of, uh, that very public statement that seemed almost silly. So let's talk know, about the know. Trump Tower meeting. We have um, his son, his campaign manager, and his son-in-law. So these aren't exactly people distant from the campaign. They have a pre-meeting before they even meet with the Russians. They have emails where the Russians say, hey, we have dirt on Hillary Clinton. We want to, the, our, our, the Russian state, they're very clear. The, the Russian government wants to help Donald Trump. We've got some dirt. We want to give it to you. Donald Trump Jr. says, love it. Um, Donald Trump, while he denies uh, right now, knowing about it ahead of time, we know there were several calls to an unidentified, a blocked number that, um, uh, Donald Trump regularly blocked, then Junior doesn't remember who he called, all this stuff. Let's say for the moment Donald Trump knew about that meeting and agreed to it and said, yeah, let's get that dirt. And they don't get any dirt. Is the attempt to get dirt from the Russians, is that a violation of law? Well, it's really hard to say. It's, it's hard to generalize because it's so fact specific. I mean, I think just taking the meeting is probably not a criminal violation. You know, it's a lot of other things. <laughs> Unwise, unpatriotic, immoral, foolish, yeah, right. right. Um, going, you know, uh, going to see what the meeting is about alone is, is not as important as what, if anything, happened at the meeting, what was agreed upon during the meeting, and did anything Well, Trump says uh, they didn't give us anything of use. Well, that's what they say, right? They've said a lot of different things about that. Well, meeting, that's true, too. Right, and so, you know, the key is going to be what Mueller finds in terms of what actually happened, and was there any kind of a deal or exchange where, you know, we'll leak out the emails or we'll give you the emails or we'll do other things to help you win in exchange for you know, softening the platform on, on Russia or lifting now, the sanctions or things like he that. He did do that. I right. mean, there was a softening of the platform on Ukraine in the Republican 
um, platform that everyone at the time, I remember saying, well, where did that come from? I don't know where that came from. Republicans were not traditionally pro-Putin or pro-Russian. Right. Uh, that wasn't exactly, um, you know, Ronald Reagan would be turning over in his grave to know that uh, we were, we were a lot allying with the evil empire. Um, so, and of course, Donald Trump has nary a bad thing to say about America's most powerful enemy. Um, you know, he, he and Vlad are, are, seem to be good buddies and he wants, he gives them, he gives them uh, classified top secret information in the White House, in the Oval Office, and, and they only know about it because of the Russian press, the American press aren't invited. He has this private meeting with Vladimir Putin for two hours. We don't know quite what he talked about. It all sure looks suspicious, but as a prosecutor, how do you take all this smoke and, and find a fire? Yeah, I mean, that's all a big part of the circumstantial evidence that I think Mueller is looking at and it sort of gives rise to his probe, right? Is, is all the facts you identified that suggest uh, the possibility, if we're looking at a quid pro quo, it looks like a quo is yeah. maybe there, right? Yeah. I mean, there were things that were done. That I mean, he got, the, he got the quid, right? right? Because because well, we know that WikiLeaks did illegally hack into Democratic emails right. that were used by Donald Trump in his campaign. Uh, we know that Donald Trump uh, even bragged when uh, the Russians said WikiLeaks stuff is coming. He bragged, we're going to have this really deadly stuff about Hillary Clinton. Right. And then when it didn't show up, he, he actually didn't come through with what he bragged about. And he got the quo. I mean, Russia has gotten more uh, velvet glove treatment uh, by Donald Trump than any president. Uh, I can go back 100 years probably and say that Russia has never been treated this kindly um, uh, in 100 years or so. Uh, maybe Yalta, we can talk about FDR. But, but the point is, is is uh, um, the quids there and the quos there, mm -hmm. is it just the pro we're yeah. looking at? <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah, it's, it's proving that it was a deal. It was a deal. To so even things. though the Russians helped him significantly and right. wanted to and agreed to, and everyone knows the Russians wanted to help him, but even though the Russians committed espionage to help him, period one, and even though Donald Trump has been really, really kind to the Russians, has given them all kinds of things and uh, that no other president has done in, in a half century, quo, we still have to prove, and even though they met secretly several times, or at least his, his his people did, you still, that's not enough as the prosecutor. You have to show that the two events are connected. The link, yep, yep. You gotta show that the, that was the deal. Because you're doing this for me, I'm gonna do this. And if the two things just happened independently, but you can't prove that they were linked, you know, that that, that, that was the deal, then it's not gonna be. Okay, so you've done these cases. Uh, I don't know, have you done campaign, um, this kind of case? Not campaign um, much, so, so much, no. Your, no. your white collar was more like SEC by a, a company? Yeah, a lot of local corruption and, and uh, fraud okay. against the government. Okay, right? but you, you yeah. did have candidates, political candidates, yep. who, who took money. So, so, well, but, so it's really not that different from McDonald. Um, candidate gets all these things of value. Mm -hmm. uh, candidate gives all these things of value to the person who gives them the money. Right. The quid and the quo are there. Uh, the pro. Um, how did you prove that one led to the other? Well, a common way is to get testimony from one side of the transaction. So, for example, in McDonald, right? They get the cooperation of the person, the one, the person paying the bribes, and have them testify about it. That's the best way. Um, or if you can get. Uh, emails or other documents where, you know, the agreement is, is evidenced, you know, when uh, other conversations that other witnesses overheard or, or documents or emails where they talked about the deal, things like that. Um, but sometimes you're just proving it by circumstantial I mean, evidence, right? Natalia Veselnitskaya mm -hmm. did say in there when she was talking about adoptions, really what she wanted was the Magnitsky Act to be reduced, which was sanctions against Russia. Right. So they come in and they say, we got all this dirt on Hillary Clinton. And they sit at the table and, and they say, it appears, we want sanctions against Russia reduced. It's sounding pretty quid pro quo -y. Yeah. I, I I don't know uh, where, where, I mean, what else do you need? I well, mean. Yeah, the thing is, I guess we don't really know that level of detail yet about what happened at the meeting. You know, Mueller may know. Okay. Uh, and how would we, Mueller know? Just from people who are at the meeting, flipping them. Right. The yeah. ultimate flippy would be Paul Manafort. Yeah. He was at the meeting. Mm -hmm. He has a lot of legal liability. Yeah, but I don't know that they have on Kushner yet. Yeah. I know they got stuff on Manafort. They may have stuff on Kushner. I wouldn't surprise me if he's got all kinds of financial violations, but those have not been indicted. They've been proven. With, with Manafort, they've been proven. I mean, he's been found guilty. A jury has found him guilty of tax evasion and all these things. 
how do you I assume there's now maximum pressure on Manafort. The more pressure is going to be on him in, in, in D.C. That would be your old stomping ground, right? Are they the, is it your is it your, some of your friends who are going after him on the Ukraine stuff? No, it's Mueller. It's, the, it's a special counsel. Okay, it's a special yeah. counsel. But um, the argument is this, the Trump argument. Yeah, you got a ton of stuff on Manafort. And yeah, he may flip. And yeah, he may say, yeah, I was there and um, I got the quit, I got the quo, here's the pro. Donald Trump's explicitly told me privately, let's give sanctions relief to the Russians in return for this stuff on Hillary, which case, slam dunk case. But they're gonna say Manafort refused to cooperate. Even after he was convicted, he refused to cooperate only when you convicted him of two or three crimes and really held him to the wall and said life imprisonment. And uh, Donald Trump didn't pardon him. Only then did he turn against me. Yeah. How do you deal with that argument? Yeah. I mean, that's the classic dilemma with any cooperator, right? I mean, uh, Gates testifying against Manafort was the same kind of thing. Right. You've got someone who's uh, pled guilty cooperating, and they're, you, you can guarantee they're going to be attacked by the defense saying, well, they'll say whatever the prosecutor wants them to say. They right. cut a deal to save their own skin. So that's kind of par for the course. So much and so the way- that the prosecutors in the Manafort case said, hey, don't worry about Gates. Just take a look at the documents. Well, that's what you do, basically. I mean, it, in almost any cooperator case, you want to get in a position where you can tell the jury, uh, look, maybe you don't like this guy. You know, we don't really like him that much either, but you don't have to take his word for anything, right? He just came in to kind of fill in around the, the bones for you, right? But all, the case is really about the documents. And you don't have to take his word alone for anything because everything he said is backed up by these other either other witnesses or other documents or things like, or, you know, others corroborating evidence. That's the position you want to be in. So the jury can say, you know, they can even take kind of Gates completely out of the case or Manafort, you know, and say, but everything he said makes sense because look at all these other documents and all the other evidence that we have. And, you know, that's typical in any, with any cooperator. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to go over what that other evidence might be. Why did it be secret recordings of Russian officials saying, we got this useful idiot. His name is Donald Trump. Uh, would that be enough? What kind of documents exist? And who'd be stupid enough to put this in an email anyway? Um, be surprised. Prosecution of the president. Uh, Richard Nixon was convicted based on tapes. Might there be tapes in this case? Let's just call in if you like. Uh, 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. Right back after this. I do find when I have a guest, I'm much less likely to get calls. Really? Um, because they're like, oh, well, you're giving lots of good information. They don't want to disturb it. If it's just me mouthing off, a lot of times they'll call and challenge me. So cool. that's actually a good sign. You're doing well. This is the last segment. It goes quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, anything else I should ask? I'll have someone ask you about documents, tapes, other sort of corroborating evidence. But any other thing that I think I should focus on? Uh, I don't know. Did you want to do the exclusion of crime point? or? Uh, okay. Yeah, we probably should explain that. It's up to you. Yeah, no, we should explain that collusion conspiracy. Okay, I'll bring that up. I think most of my listeners know that because I've talked about it. It's just sort of an informal way we talk about conspiracy. Uh, No, I don't. Oh, that's that's why I don't see my calls. (laughs) Let me do that. I had to use uh, Firefox. In fact, if you will please tell... um, Alex, that he has to update Chrome, otherwise live Facebook isn't working. And I can't update it because I'm not an administrator on their account. No, I do have some callers here. Do have time for them though. All right. All right, we'll take one caller and then we'll answer one of your questions. Oh, that's an interesting point though. All right, I'll bring up the other guy's point as well. 
call from San Francisco and a call from the Bronx. They gave, they gave you that up front? No. Downstairs. Oh, downstairs. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. See, if you had, if you came in with me, that wouldn't have been. No big deal. So you're not going to make it to the show? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to make it. All right. Oh, I'm coming. Great. No, they give me really good seats, so, you know. Oh, yeah, premium seats. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. A little reception before the show. But there was no quid pro quo whatsoever. <laughs> I did it before I even knew about that. That's the problem, right? Well, there you go. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. politicians do things Looks for people. Suspicious. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know, I know. But I, my argument is that I got a former uh, white-collar crimes prosecutor who was involved, <laughs> so Signed off. his integrity is... Uh, yeah. Is, uh, I don't know how far that's going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up taking those. Remember at the Schlesinger meeting, they were saying oh, December 20th and 21st were open. And mm -hmm. We're saying they thought that was too late. Yeah, but you so took it. They decided to do it. Yeah. Great. I'm glad. So. I'm really glad. I don't think it's too late. Yeah. It should be the last, the last one of the season. No, I was I was worried. I think people are getting a little busy right before last weekend before Christmas. It's better than not having it at all. Yes, exactly. So and probably better than having it at the high school. So it's, it's a nicer deal. Ready. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. I'm here with former white collar crimes prosecutor Randall Eliasson. Only got a few minutes left. I want to quickly go to David, line four in San Francisco. Go ahead, David. Oh, Michael. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Oh, all right. Sorry, David. Go ahead, David. <laughs> well, no, Mike, we'll get to Michael in a minute. You go ahead, David. Yes. Oh, he's done a lot of great work for some vicious dictators. Um, he's kind of the dictator's best friend. Right. 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 But, but, and David, we're running out of time. So, so I want to, I want to just, add, just, well, that's exactly right. So thank you for your call, David. Randall, is it a crime to do all kinds of favors for dictators all over the world? Um, <laughs> well, not necessarily. No, no. I mean, if you... I mean, as unsavory and disgusting right. as that is, there's no for them federal a law against filing it. Filing all the reports you're supposed to file and paying taxes and what they pay you. So his problem is not that he did these unsavory acts for unsavory people. It's just that he didn't report them and... and, and Declare them on his taxes. Hid and laundered all the money and failed to register as a foreign agent and all the other things that he's charged with. Okay, fair enough. Let's go now to Michael in the Bronx. Michael, go ahead. Uh, okay, I got your question, Michael. Let me give Randall a chance to respond to it. Randall, can, can Rudy Giuliani for lying uh, on TV about Donald Trump, can that ever be a crime? Probably not. Uh, I mean, it's generally not a crime to lie to the public. <laughs> um, you know, if you could construct some theory where that was part of a broader conspiracy to obstruct justice or something, 
maybe, but I think it's pretty unlikely. Yeah, He's, probably you know, not Rudy Giuliani. So where do we go from here? We only got about a minute and a half. We are talking about the kind of evidence you need. You might get Manafort to flip, what, secret conversations with the Russians? That would be difficult because we don't want to disclose the intelligence we use to collect them, I assume. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 a lot of really complicating factors in this case, including that the Russians are now back in Russia and are not going to be available to be witnesses. So, you know, they, they would be key sources of information. But anybody who was in the meeting, whether it's Manafort, Kushner, Don Jr., you know, or anybody else that is available to testify, any documents memorializing What about his accountant that just flipped? The guy that had been working for the Trump ever yeah, since Weiss, Trump's devisor. Yeah, yeah. Weiss, Weiss River, Weiss River, something. Yeah. Um, doesn't sound like he's as tied to the campaign stuff. It sounds like he's more tied to the Trump organization. Do you think we're going to find Trump organization payoffs and laundering? I mean, this guy seems like he's been corrupt for some years, and could that be used? Well, there's a whole separate category of investigation involving, you know, the Trump Financial organization, crimes. real estate in New York, and money laundering. That's a whole separate. And the thing about that is, if he yeah. violates New York state law, no one can be pardoned except by the governor of New York. Right. So I've always felt that's a good place. Randall, we talked about a lot in an hour. Thank you for coming here on the Insights. Hey, my pleasure. It's Appreciate fun. it. All right, we got a lot done in a short period of time. Yeah, let's go by pretty fast. Thanks, Mark.